So welcome everyone. Thanks for coming out on this cold morning uh, to the third lecture of the series, the spring, spring lecture series of the Center for Children and Families. I'm Margaret Owen. I direct the center and I'm really happy to see you all. And if you're sitting far away, come closer if you want to. Otherwise, we kind of go like this, but we see friends everywhere. Anyway, um, it's really a joy for me, having Dr. Margaret Kai here in Dallas, I will say back here in Dallas, she um, was recruited away from us two and a half years ago to the University of Georgia. Um, she's now on the, I'll tell you who she is now, or what her new role is. Margaret is on the faculty in the department of, it's different from our departments, Development and Family Science at University of Georgia. And she serves there as the Georgia Athletic Association Professor in Family Health Disparities. I love her title, don't you? <laughs> it's great. Um, for most of Margaret's time here in Dallas, she and I collaborated on two longitudinal studies. The first one was about four years in length, but the second one has been going on now for, I guess, about 10 years. Um, but thanks now to video conferencing, instead of going up and down the um, highways between UT Southwestern, where Margaret was on the faculty, in the Dallas Regional Campus of the University of Texas School of Public Health, um, which is down there at UT Southwestern, instead of going up and down the highways, we now have all of our meetings almost weekly uh, via video conferencing. Things have gotten in some ways easier, <laughs> in some ways easier. Um, I won't tell you more about that longitudinal project, the longitudinal project that we're on together and have been for so long because uh, I know she's gonna tell you more about it. Um, but from her doctoral degree in the Department of Maternal and Child Health from Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, her research over the past 20 years has combined the contents, has addressed the contents of risk and resilience in the context of family life, families, uh, families particularly who are um, race, racial, ethnic minorities. And you'll hear about this as well. Uh, she examines how race ethnic disparities in health and development can be understood from the context of these unique ecological contexts. Her research has received funding from numerous federal grants to address how inequities in family and community processes affect the cognitive development, social emotional development, and early academic achievement in children in diverse race ethnic race ethnic groups. In addition, you should know that she's been highly honored for her teaching prowess. She's the recipient, recipient of a University of Texas, Texas Regents Award for her teaching. Um, it's both been an extreme pleasure and an inspiration to have worked with you, Margaret, over these 17 years. Um, when we found each other, really 20, <laughs> I want to say 20 years ago, 17 years, merely. We'll get there to 20. Um, we knew we had found um, colleagues with very compatible and exciting interests that we want, uh, where we wanted to pursue our work together. And uh, working together has been a joy. And I can say that for most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> so please join me in welcoming Dr. Margaret Kai. All right, well, thank you very much for having me here today. Um, I thank you so much, Margaret, for that um, wonderful, warm introduction. As I told her, she almost started me to cry. And that's, but we have. We've been working together for a long time, and it's true that when I was first recruited here in the School of Public Health, uh, there wasn't really anybody in that group that did my kind of research, and I, I contacted a woman. Uh, I don't know if you know her. Uh, she's quite well known in the field. Her name is Aletha Houston. She was at the University of Texas and Austin in their Human Development and Family Sciences um, Department. I said, do you know anybody in Dallas that might, I might be interested in contacting to, um, to, to do research with? And before I accepted the job, I, I, I came and visited Margaret in this very building. And um, I knew then there was just this synergy. There was a click. And I knew that we were going to be uh, not only great colleagues, but also uh, fast friends. And um, 
it, it absolutely has been a joy. So thank you very much for that. So today my talk is going to be on dads and their kids, and particularly focused on the positive relationships that fathers have with their children and how those relationships are important for the development, the healthy development of their children. Everybody knows that fathers are often overlooked, both in terms of research. So the vast majority of our research on parenting is actually research on mothering. Uh, only a very small portion of it is focused on fathers. The same thing is, is true about our programs. So the programs that we develop to support parents of young children primarily focus on mothers, and very few of them integrate fathers. Um, and this is particularly true for low-income African-American and Latino fathers. Indeed, these fathers are often stereotyped as being uninvolved and neglectful. And what I want to do today is to focus on how these fathers in particular support their, uh, the healthy development of their children with their positive relationships. I'm going to be using some data to illustrate this from our longitudinal study that Margaret mentioned. And I'm also going to talk about the implications of this for service delivery. So this stereotype, this negative stereotype of low-income fathers is particularly strong for black fathers. And this dates back to the 1960s. There was a senator by the name of Patrick Moynihan who issued a report in the 1960s that focused on the family structures in the United States and pointed out that uh, black children were much less likely to be living in families with two married parents and much more likely to be living in families headed by a single mother. And Moynihan's contention was that this absence of fathers in the lives of black children was responsible for the higher rates of poverty, the higher rates of academic failure that we saw in this population. The problem is, if you take data like this on family structure, and then you extrapolate it to make assumptions about the involvement of fathers with their children, your assumptions are going to be mistaken. So here's some data from the Centers for Disease Control. So these are national survey data. And it's looking at the involvement of fathers with their children on a daily basis. So to what degree did they, um, were they involved in their daily care? So feeding with them, eating with them, bathing them, diapering and dressing, and also playing with them and reading with them. And what you see here is that this, so the gray column here are African-American fathers. And you can see that their rates or involvement are just as high or even higher than fathers in other race ethnic groups. Now this is for fathers who are resident or fathers who are living with, the, with their child. But these are data for non-resident fathers. And so keep in mind, this is the percentage who are engaged in these activities with their, their child on a daily basis. All right, and so you can see that we've got, what, 12 to over 15, 16% of fathers who aren't living with their child who are in, engaged in these activities on a daily basis. So clearly, this stereotype of these fathers uh, not being involved with their children um, is not consistent with the data. So let me tell you a little bit about the study that Margaret was referring to. We call it the Dallas Preschool Readiness Project. And this is a study of African-American and Latino low-income children uh, living in Dallas County. Uh, it's a little, the sample is a little over 400 kids. And we recruited the sample, like she said, about 10 years ago now, between uh, 2009 and 2011. When we started the study, the children were two and a half years old. And since then, we followed them up five times. We've seen them when they were three and a half, when they were in kindergarten, first grade, fourth grade, and right now we're in the middle of collecting data on them when they're in fifth grade, and we're going to be following them uh, right now until seventh grade. And we've collected data on a whole wide range of data, uh, direct observations of the children's self-regulation skills, the, their relationships with their mothers and with their fathers, uh, data on their academic achievement, on their, their behaviors, and also a wide range of um, household characteristics. So you can see here that a little over half of the sample is Latino. 
and the remainder is African American. The average household income to needs ratio is about 82% of the federal poverty level, so this is a low income sample. And then for our Latino families, about three quarters of those are the parents are foreign born, and the majority of them either speak Spanish or are bilingual. And out of those families, about three quarters of them had a uh, father or father figure living in the household. And that was about 60% of the African American households enrolled in the study and about 90% of the Latino households. And these are the characteristics of the fathers in the sample. So you can see that most of them are the father or the stepfather, about 64% of the African American families that father was a, a um, the father or stepfather and then about over 90% of the um, Latino families. But we also had uh, father figures who were partners of the, the child's mother, grandparents, uh, older siblings, and also other adult relatives. So we also collected data on father involvement. And this was collected at the first time point, so when the children were uh, two and a half years old, and this is based on the uh, maternal report. <coughs> So you can see this is the percentage of fathers who engaged in these activities with their children at least five times per week. So on this side, you've got you know, the more daily care, so feeding the child and changing the child's diaper. And down here, you have more of the play activities. But by and large, what you see across all of the, these different activities is that these fathers are very involved, that the vast majority of them are involved in taking care of their child on a daily basis as well as playing with their child on a daily basis. So again, these data suggest that that stereotype of fathers in this group being uninvolved in their, with their children is not consistent, that they're involved with their children on a daily basis in a very positive way. So we also collected observational data on the relationship of fathers with their children using uh, an interaction task that uh, Dr. Owen has used for many, many years, where we give the father and the child a set of toys in three different bags. Uh, one bag, the first bag included a book, the second bag included a, um, a toolbox, and the third bag included, it was a toy school with little figures and a vehicle. And they were basically told to play with this set of toys for 15 minutes, and it was videotaped. And then those tapes were rated for some global indicators of father sensitivity, father cognitive stimulation, positive regard, negative regard, intrusiveness, and attachment. And this is just a little snippet. This is a father who was ra uh, rated as very um, high in sensitivity. <laughs> Okay, so what are some of the markers of sensitivity that we see in this, in this dad? So he's down there with the child, really engaged at her level. He's following her lead. Uh, he's very positive. You can see that they, he takes a lot of joy in playing with his child. So we took these um, six indicators that we rated of the father's behavior, and we looked at whether there were patterns, were there different clusters of these behaviors that indicated different profiles of fathers. And we identified, at age two and a half, we identified three profiles. One was called child-oriented, and that's this, oops, wait a minute, push the wrong button. That's this first group, and so this blue bar is sensitivity and cognitive stimulation and positive regard. So these are our dads who have very high levels of sensitivity and positive regard and cognitive stimulation, very low levels of, of um, negativity. So that's our first group is child-oriented. 
The second group is directive, so they have slightly lower levels of sensitivity and positive regard, and a little bit higher in terms of intrusiveness. And then our final group we called the hostile group, and these had high levels of negative regard and intrusiveness. So when we looked at all of the dads in our study, this is basically what they looked like in terms of the breakdown, how they fell into those three groups. So I think what's important to point out is that fewer than 8% of the fathers in the sample fell into the hostile group, that the rest of the dads were relatively evenly split between the child-oriented group, those are the dads who had high levels of sensitivity and cognitive stimulation and positive regard, and the other half fell into the directive group. It's a little lower on sensitivity and a little bit more directive or intrusive, but still, these are generally positive um, forms of father-child interaction. So again, when we talk about that stereotype of um, low-income fathers being, um, being neglectful, that's not supported by the data that we have. We find high levels of very positive uh, child, uh, father-child relationships. We also find that there's a relationship between child, the experience of child-oriented fathering by the child and their executive function development. And this is over and above the impact of mothering. So this is after we take the sensitivity of their mother-child relationship into account. Is there additional variance in their executive function that's explained by their experience of child-oriented fathering? So this is a, a paper that we published in, in 2013 that looked kind of cross-sectionally. So this is child-oriented parenting when they're two and a half and their executive functioning at the same time. And what we find is that for our African-American children, if they, were, uh, if they had an experience of a child-oriented father, then those kids had higher scores on our executive function measure. And likewise, when we look a year later, so this is an executive function measure when they're three and a half based related to their experience of child-oriented fathering when they're two and a half, we find that our African-American children who experienced child-oriented fathering when they were two and a half had higher executive functioning scores when they were one year later. Now, we did not find differences in our Latino dyads based on the experience of child-oriented fathering. And I'll be honest with you, I don't, we don't really know why. So we've tried to see if it was explained by level of involvement, if it was, uh, you know, sensitivity. There's very high levels of sensitivity in the father-child interactions in our Latino dyads. So we haven't been able to figure that out. So if anybody in the question and answer period, if anyone has some ideas of what we might look at, we are, um, we are open to that. We'd love to hear more. Oops. Hold on. All right. So often in research on fathering, um, one of the abiding interests is uh, whether or not the uh, fathering is related to child outcome or whether fathers are the same as mothers. So do they show the same levels of sensitivity? And um, do they show other behaviors that are different from what mothers, the way mothers interact with their kids? And by and large, most of the research indicates that levels of father sensitivity are very similar to levels of mother sensitivity, and that's what we found in our data. So if you, we take the same child in our study, and we have father data and mother data on that child, and look at whether or not there are any differences in the, in the sensitivity levels that that, father, that that child experiences based on the gender of their mother, and there's not. The fathers and the mothers are similar in terms of their, uh, in terms of their level of sensitivity. There is uh, another question, though, is whether or not the experience of fathering is associated with child outcomes in the same way that the experience of mothering is. And we do have some indication that there are, some, that there are differences. So what we have found is that uh, sensitive fathering in early childhood is associated with better mathematics performance when the children get to kindergarten, whereas sensitive mothering is associated with better, better performance in reading when the children get to kindergarten, uh, and not vice versa. So mothering, now this is when sensitive mothering and sensitive fathering are in the analysis together. It's not when they're, they're being analyzed separately. But sensitive mothering is not associated with better math achievement, and sensitive fathering is not uh, associated with better reading achievement. Again, 
we don't really know why. At least in terms of the things that we have measured up to date, we haven't been able to explain that difference. So that has raised the question for us is, are we measuring the right things? Are there other things going on that we haven't measured? Let's see. So there is a literature about how fathers differ from mothers that we've been drawing upon. Uh, probably most, one of the most well-known is has to do with physical play. So fathers have well-documented um, research that shows that fathers are more likely to engage in physical play with their children, and particularly in rough and tumble play. There's also research that suggests that fathers are more likely to tease their children, they're more likely to encourage risk-taking, and they're also more likely to use challenging language. And what do, what do I mean by challenging language? So there's research that indicates that fathers use more WH questions with their young children. So what, why, when, that they're less attuned to the child's language skills and also less likely to uh, continue the child's topic of conversation. And that all suggests that the father's language interaction with their child is more challenging than, than the mother's. So there's a researcher in fathering, his name is Daniel Packett from the University of Montreal, and he has proposed that the, there is an essential difference in the relationship between fathers and their children and mothers and their children, and he calls this the activation relationship. So what is the activation relationship? I'm just going to read you what Daniel Packett says, because it just captures it better than anybody I've been able to, better than I can say. So fathers play a particularly important role in the development of children's openness to the world. Men seem to have a tendency to excite, surprise, and momentarily destabilize children. They also tend to encourage children to take risks, while at the same time ensuring the latter's safety and security, thus permitting children to learn to be braver in unfamiliar situations, as well as to stand up for themselves. So what Packett argues is that this unique kind of activation relationship is important for children's outcomes, particularly when it comes to things like autonomy development and also social competence. So I'm going to share with you a couple of examples of an activation relationship. This is not, it's not the same one, but yeah. <laughs> This is an example of rough and tumble play. And you can see very clearly how this dad is activating his child. And the kid is very activated and is having a wonderful time. All right, another example. This one may come up with an ad. We'll just have to see.
actually that's a fairly, I came across, you know, I've often questioned whether there was any um, value to Twitter because I just don't get it. Sorry, young people. I just, I mean, I have Twitter. I know I'm supposed to use Twitter, and I'm like, I don't know. I did come across this on Twitter uh, and then found this, uh, and it was around the time that I was starting to think about what was it about dads that we weren't capturing, right? So maybe there was something providential, but I tell you, that, that's the kind of video, if you're having a bad day, just pull up and watch the kid walk, ride the roller coaster. Um, so clearly, you know, she's being activated, but safely, like she's, you know, he's taking care of her, and so she's getting to enjoy this excitement, the thrill of it, with, with no risk. Now, both of those examples, the rough and tumble play and this virtual roller coaster, these are fairly dramatic examples of activation. So one of the things that we've started asking our, ourselves is, would we see kind of elements of this activation behavior within the context of more day-to-day -day, uh, interactions? Um, and, you know, well, we have videotapes of, you know, 200 and... 60 dads and their kids, and so we, start, we started looking at these videotapes and seeing whether we see examples of um, this kind of activation behavior in more kind of a day-to-day -day basis. So I've got two dads here. Uh, one of them, both of these dads are rated as highly sensitive. One is the dad that, that I showed you before. The other is a different dad. Um, and the, the dad, the first dad is a more low activation dad. The other dad is a little higher, and I'm going to show you the... Um, both videos, and we'll talk about what we see. Uh, in both of these, they're going to be interacting with the book that's part of the part of the study. All right, this one I'll give you a little longer clip, but here we go. You want to see some new toys? You want to see some more FedEx? Those are good. You want to see? You should. Okay. Go ahead and see. Let's see what's in back. That one. Let's see what's in there. Yeah, let's see what's in there. Bring it over here. Right here. Let me see. Let's empty it out. Wow, look. Look. It's a book. Let's see. Let's see what it says. It says good night. What is it? Um, um, uh, uh. Say it. Monster. <laughs> Monster. That's a gorilla. And who is that? A police. That's right. It says good night gorilla. See the little gorilla? He's trying to get his keys. <gasps> he got out of his cage. Oh. Look. The policemen don't even know it. <gasps> Look at that. What is that? What's that? I'm over. What is that? Look at the balloon. I see the balloon. What is that? Is that a elephant? Right. And then he goes to a lion cage. You see that? Good night, lion. He opens up the door. So we have a monkey, an elephant, and a lion out of their cage. <gasps> and look. A giraffe. Do you see that? They want to let him out of his cage. Okay. So, what did y'all see? I'm going to open this up to the audience. What did you see in the second dad that might be characterized as more activation? Thoughts? So lots of questions, right? So the first dad did use some W questions, right? But the second dad used them a lot. So definitely a higher volume of what, yes, that was definitely one of the first things that I noticed. Anybody else? And he was more dramatic. He was more dramatic. That, oh, look, oh, getting excited. Anything else? Did anybody notice his behavior at the very beginning of the interaction? It was kind of hard to hear. You had to listen closely. Did anyone see what he did? He said, do you want to see the toys? You want to see what's in the bag? Are you sure? You want to see? You know, so he's like building this excitement. So the, the question that we're starting to ask ourselves is that, you know, are, are these elements of that kind of activation behavior that Packet talks about? Um, and 
is it reliably seen within these dads? Is it different from sensitivity? I mean, you now we're just starting to work with this, so I don't know the answer to these questions yet. But you know, we do seem to see it in some dads that are sensitive and not other dads who are rated sensitive. So it's not being captured by our sensitivity measure. We're also seeing some of this. We, have, we looked at some of our dads that were rated as low in sensitivity, and we see some of this behavior. So we're at, right now, we're trying to refine this code so we can go back and look at, is there systematic variation in this activation across our dads? Uh, we'd like to be able to look at the moms. You know, is this different? You know, do we see this behavior in our, in our moms? Uh, we haven't started looking at those videos yet. Um, so the, the question is, does this characterize our, our dads? Uh, differently than it, it characterizes the moms in the study. Um, and then related to that question is whether or not it makes any difference. So is this uniquely related to some of their outcomes? And uh, you know, obviously we don't know yet because we're still in the process of, of you know, looking at, at this a little bit more deeply and collecting the data and going back and recoding. Now there is evidence in other parts of the literature that this activation behavior on the parts of, of fathers does make a difference for, for kids' development. So remember I mentioned something about the challenging language, and that um, so they found that more challenging language for fathers is associated with more frequent and more complex responses on the part of their children. So the language development of young children is impacted by this more challenging language. There's also some suggestion that physical play, so that rough and tumble play, is associated with better uh, motor development, better emotion regulation, and also better peer competence. <clears throat> so clearly, dads play an important and unique role in the development of their children. So the next question is, uh, <coughs> do we have programs that serve families with young children? We have lots of programs to serve families trying to support the healthy development of children, but how many of them actually serve fathers? So this is a systematic review that was done by Lee and colleagues, and they went back through the literature to find as many references to studies of programs serving fathers in the literature. They were specifically focused on programs during the perinatal period, so basically before and right after the birth of a child. They didn't put any date restrictions, so it's not like they just saw, you know, searched back to 2000, uh, but the the papers they ended up with basically went back to like the mid-1980s were the earliest ones. They identified over 1,300 perinatal uh, parenting programs, and out of that, only 19 of them were quote-unquote father-friendly. So that was 1% of the programs over about 30 years of these perinatal programs were quote-unquote father-friendly. And the definition of father-friendly was fairly loose. It was just that they targeted fathers. Didn't say how they tar targeted fathers. Did they target fathers effectively? Who knows? But it's just that they targeted fathers and they measured fathers' outcomes. So out of 1,353 programs, only 19, or 1% of them, actually served fathers. And of those, only three of those studies were considered high quality and very few demonstrated impacts of, on fathers. So clearly, there is a need for more uh, programs that are targeted toward fathers. So Lee and colleagues also did some qualitative work. This was in the city of Detroit. And they did key informant interviews with service providers that uh, provide programs to fathers, parenting programs to fathers, as well as fathers themselves in terms of what fathers needed. And one of the themes that came out of this qualitative work was that fathers need a whole comprehensive suite of programs. So it's not just focused on parenting and parenting education, but a whole suite of services because it's often issues in these other domains that may not be directly specific to parenting that impact and create barriers for them being able to engage with their children in a positive way. So top of the list was employment support because um, getting a job, keeping a job, having a job was the number one barrier in uh, impacting whether fathers were able to engage with their kids. And related to that, specifically for fathers who were uh, non-residential, had to do with navigating the child support system. Fathers who were returning from the criminal justice system needed special services to address the issues that they faced. Another thing that they, many of them identified was the importance of having positive fatherhood mentorship. 
So having another father who had, had similar struggles but had overcome those struggles and was engaged with their, their children in a positive way was also important for these dads. And finally, the issue of support for navigating the co-parenting relationship. And again, this is particularly an issue for non-residential fathers because often if there's a contentious relationship between the father and, the children's, and his children's mother, that mother will act as a gatekeeper and keep the father away from their, the children. And so being able to uh, navigate and have a positive co-parenting relationship with the children's mother is really important. What did they say in terms of, of what was the best way to engage them? Well, many of the dads in this study who uh, participated in this study perceived an anti-dad bias in many of the service programs. And so service providers that had been in, uh, successful engaging in, with fathers suggested that you had to engage fathers where they were. So not expecting them to come into a program, but rather going out into the community wherever they may, might be. So that might be in schools, that might be through sporting events, that might be through barbershops, but anywhere where you can access the fathers in the community. This issue of showing empathy comes up again. So having these male providers who can uh, share their own struggles with, with the client fathers and also engage with them more as peers than as service professionals as a way of building trust. And finally, designing events that dads can get excited about. So opportunities for the father and child to demonstrate the pride that they have in their relationship can be very effective in engaging dads. And finally, having fathers to reflect on their role. So reflecting on their relationship with their own father and what would they like to be different, what would they like to be the same, and how they can then um, reflect that in the relationship with their own children. But service agencies themselves need to become more father friendly. And this spans across the physical environment, the staff, and the way the services are provided. So is the service uh, agency itself, is a physical setting, is it father friendly? So are there resources in the waiting room for, for dads? Do they have promotional materials and uh, posters on the wall that have images of fathers in both the wording and the images? Um, what do the staff think about the fathers? Do, they, do the staff have any biases that may be impacting their ability to engage fathers? Do they know the, the situations of the fathers that they're trying to serve? And then service de delivery. Do the, are services provided in with flexible scheduling so that fathers would be able to participate uh, based on what their work schedules are? And when you send appointment reminders, it seems kind of minor, but do you just send reminders to the mother or are you also uh, engaging the father? So it, there's clearly uh, a lot of opportunities, but as well as responsibilities in the research that we do, um, as well as with the services that we're trying to provide for children, because we're all interested in um, improving the chances of children to lead healthy lives. So in terms of research, we need more research on the unique ways that fathers impact the lives of their, their children. Uh, we really need a new lens. For so long, as I mentioned, most of the research, virtually all of the research is based on mothers. And a lot of the research on fathers has just been taking the way that we've looked at mothers and then transporting it to looking at fathers. So we need to kind of start over, go back to looking just at fathers and trying to understand the unique ways that they engage with their children and not just rely on the frame that we've used with mothers. In terms of programs, we need to normalize fathers in these family programs. So it really should be the rule and the exception. Because I think if we can increase both our research as well as uh, the service of fathers in these family programs, then we have a much better chance of improving the lives of the children that we're trying to serve. So before I end, I do want to just make some acknowledgments because as uh, Dr. Owen mentioned, this program, this project's been going on for 10 years and there are a lot of people that have been involved in collecting and managing this whole process. And many of them are here in the audience today. If, you were in, if you're involved in this project in any of the phases, could you mind standing up? Carmen, stand up. Danny, stand up. Maisha, stand up. Class, stand up. Anybody who's involved, stand up. I particularly want to point out, this is Plastilla Arnold. She's been involved since phase one. You'll see her name in phase one, phase two, and in phase three. So Plass knows our families like nobody else does. Um, so she's been, she recruited most of our, 
uh, most of the African American families, and um, has been really a, a stalwart of this program. And we are very thankful to you for that. Um, so with that, I will end and open it up for questions. Yes? If you look at all the, at the differences between Paul and their daughters and their sons. We did, um, and I'm going to have to try to remember, because we also stratify, stratified by ethnicity. And I think there was like one difference that was significant, but then I started wondering if this issue of multiple testing, you know, when you're looking at six things by girls versus boys, and you know what I mean? And so I wasn't totally convinced that it was, um, it was reliable, because I only saw the result pop up once. Yeah. I can see that fathers are much more rough with their sons than they would be with their daughters. Well, and the literature does support that, and I think that we've also been talking as a group in that this activity that we used with the kids may not have been uh, the best one for fathers. So did it, you know, this kind of quiet activity of playing with toys on the floor together, that it may have limited or restricted the range of behaviors that we observed. Um, and so if we could go back in time, you know, and do something else with the dads, I think it would have been good. But we have what we have. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, there it is. So when we talk about the supports that, you know, like job, uh, job placement and, and employment, what, two things, what does that say about who says that those things need to be in place? In other words, a lot of times we see those dads and we're like, they need this. Mm -hmm. And or what do we see as impact on child outcomes? Because we see these programs where we have all these things in place and is that a projection from service providers that these guys need it? Because we all know they have those needs. Right. But yet we're the ones providing that. And then the, on the other piece of that is, does it impact child outcomes? In other words, we know that if a dad has a job, so financially there's some more stability. And at the same time, then he's less time with the child. And so there's that, right. that breakdown. Because a lot of times what we see in programs is we're projecting all these dads. And when we look at every one of those supports was for the stereotypical minority dad. Right. All these guys need jobs. All these guys are coming out of prison. All these guys are this, which is not necessarily the case. So the question is, does the research pr prove that through, or is it what we're projecting on this population? We know there's some need, but it's that, right. that um, line. Well, so the answer, I think, is a little bit complicated. So I think that with, like, in terms of this qualitative research, that was the message coming from dads, not from service providers. I think that's one thing. I think the other issue that you're pointing to, though, is that um, the lives of these fathers with their children is happening in a broader socio-cultural context, which may or may not have jobs that support dads in the way that really support them to be dads. So, and, and this impacts our moms as well. So, you know, when you, get, when you have an economy where uh, you're reliant on um, low, low skilled, low, low paying jobs, and so then moms and dads are having to, in order to make ends meet, uh, you know, we talk about the, the federal poverty level is 100% of the federal poverty level. If you actually look at how much it takes to quote unquote get by, it's actually pretty standard, it's twice that. Okay, but um, and then if you look at how much someone has to earn in order to make that, it is well above what minimum wage is and what many of the jobs. And so, you know, my question is not like whether or not uh, programs are foisting that upon kid, uh, fathers, but whether economically the structure of the society is created a way where there are jobs available so people can make a living wage and still be able to engage with their, their families. So it's a bigger social political. Well, yeah. one of the challenges, we have a 10 week class for dads. We're trying to engage them into his non custodial dads, most of them. Mm -hmm. And then the low hanging fruit was truck driving jobs. Exactly. And so, and yeah. so we're like, no. And it was a service provider issue, right. not what dads were looking for. Right. So we said, we can get all these guys a job driving a truck because that's easy for the agency. Right. And then we're putting these ads on the road, which keeps right. them away from the children. So it's and, that, 
And we, we had that issue as well because the, um, if, you, if you recall the timeline of data collection, we were enrolling these families um, right after the economic collapse of 2008. And it had the, the, the effects of that were reverberating through the, the um, population was really hitting here at the time we were enrolling families. And we had that where dads were leaving. So we had these involvement questions. Do you do it with their, you know, this, and you know, the, the moms would say, well, He's at, you know, he's working in Washington State for a month, and then he's back for two weeks. And while he's here, he does this every day, but then he's gone, right? So, um, yeah, it's it's complicated. Question in the back? Yes. I just want to kind of piggyback on thing what Mike is saying. Uh, we probably work with the same program, so <laughs> I'm with Focus. So we do this every day, yeah. and so what you guys just saw, I'm with a program called Fatherhood Effect. Mm -hmm. And what we do, what you just saw, is what I do every day. Mm -hmm. And for those folks who don't see that, when you don't engage dads uh, in the lives of their children, th those are the outcomes that you get. We, I do this every day with dads who say exactly what you're talking about. We need the jobs. We need that. We need the barriers not to be there. Mm -hmm. We need programs to be father-friendly. Mm -hmm. And it is those things that keep dads from engaging in their families. Mm -hmm. um, that we, they have a desire to want to love their kids. And that's why we're, we're here today, because we want people to know that. And we thank you for what you're doing, because this is what dads are telling us. People don't know, you make it hard for me to love my children, mm -hmm. to be engaged with my children. Um, and they're just asking the system, stop making it hard for me to be a father. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and, and the system needs to own that. Yeah. Society needs to own that, but not put the blame on these dads. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I'm curious about this study, uh, uh, looking at all at the relationship between the dad and the school, or the dad and the teachers. Mm -hmm. So I wish we had those. I wish we had those data. Um, we did. Yeah. I mean, I know when we went back at Wave. So with Wave Two, uh, Wave One, when the kids were two and a half, we did the father-child interaction, and then when we went back at Wave Two, we tried to get interview data with the dads. And it was just an abysmal failure in terms of the number of dads. It's, it's very complicated to get their involvement just because of the logistics of managing the data collection. Uh, I have a colleague in, um, in Georgia who just recently started a, fun, uh, a project with um, African American dads living in rural areas of Georgia looking at the transition to fatherhood. So he's, his sample is focused on the dads as opposed to the kids, and so he's, I, he should be able to get those kinds of data, but we don't have those data. We do have data from the mother's report of the relationship, her relationship with the school. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so I come from a public library setting. I'm a librarian and am very involved in um, preschool programming, mm -hmm. and as you might imagine, story time and other pre preschool programs, it's primarily female caregivers that show up. It's always really nice when a male caregiver shows up. And so I'm wondering what kind of suggestions you might have for encouraging that. I would love to see that more and how the library might provide a setting, perhaps in partnership with other people, that's, for that's that to be family friend or to be father friendly. I would say, I mean, that's what I was just going to suggest, partnering with like one of these programs and take, can you take story time to them? I mean, do y'all have settings or activities where that would be? So we had a reading morning yesterday at a school with 85 dads that showed up with their kids because it was specifically for dads and kids. Mm -hmm. And we read like, and this sounds crazy, but we read like men. I, we model masculine reading. And the reason I say that is when you come in and read like a mom, which kids love, Dads don't love it because we read like, <laughs> you know, the more dramatic piece. Yeah. And so if I have to sit there and listen to bunnies and things, <laughs> you know, I mean, that's very stereotypical. Please understand that. Yeah. But it's directly, the main thing is they'll come if they're invited as fathers. Mm -hmm. Story time is not for them. And when they walk in and there are two dads and 20 moms, then they're not going to come back. This story, yeah. Then, or if, when, I, when we're playing and I'm reading and everybody's looking at me like, why are you? It's not wrestle time, it's reading time. Well, that's both. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you do it right. Yeah. But that, I mean, and that's just those issues of, of, of 
first off, directly by them. And then the other piece is, and it doesn't have to be, you know, all about heavy equipment. We don't read books about heavy equipment, but it does. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it, gives, it just gives them the opportunity to be comfortable more so. Right. You know, so even if you're doing a reading time, if the books are more varied with some action, with some noise, those kind of things. Uh, yeah, that was the other thing that we, I did, the clip didn't, but this dad, the one that I said, the higher activation, when they get further and they have the cars, he's all about vroom, vroom, and, you know, all the sound effects and that sort of a thing. So do you, so the, the kind of book reading you saw with that dad, is that what you, you see a lot of this? <gasps> yeah, yeah, we model it because we, they don't know that they have permission. So when we read to them, we, we do um, head to toe by Eric Carl, mm -hmm. so we get to act like gorillas and monkeys and elephants, and so they get permission to do that. We also do uh, bear hunt, mm -hmm. and so we're crazy and wild and running. But we're modeling that, and Dad will say, I, I want to learn to read like that. See, so you already know. You know how to make, you make up sounds, you make up words and songs on the radio, <laughs> you, you wrestle with your kid. Yeah, well, that's all of this was just a comment. But they don't know they have permission. Mm -hmm. So we had an assistant principal here us tell about some of the research about what happens when dads read. Mm -hmm. She was that happened in my house the other night, so what happened? I walk by my daughter's room and my husband is wrapping the book to my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> I said, did the book rhyme? She goes, not at all. <laughs> I said, did, did she hate it? She goes, no, she loved it. Now, I can't read that book because I don't read it. <laughs> but it's, he, took, he had to take that step. Right. That's, that's all we want to do is open that up. So if you actually have a specific dad and kid story time, you're going to fill the book. And you got to give it time for the word for the moms to go tell the dad. Well, would there be too changing the perception of what story time is? I know that's kind of the perception, yeah. but yeah. the way the father read in the video, the very right. interactive one, that is how we read at least right. in our story times. But if you just don't see the fathers. No, but we're in a room full of women and everybody's looking at us. Yeah. And they're not. Yeah, but, I understand. Yeah. That. yeah. yeah. I think it's more fun to hear about programs like yours than what I'm going to say right now. But I'm thinking, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I to try this. Um, Margaret, when you talked about you know, the difficulties of going back and trying to get the interviews from the dads, I'm thinking maybe we're doing our studies wrong in studying fathers in that we typically start with a study uh, and we're looking at parenting, but we're, we're, we're recruiting the mothers. Mm -hmm. And then we try to, oh, and we need fathers too. And then we try to add in the fathers. Instead, we should start with a study recruiting the dads. Right. This is a study about dads and their relationships with their kids, not an add-on. Oh, and there are fathers too. But I think, you know, the, the literature is that way. Right. I mean, I think our approach is that way, and we know why it's harder. And that, I mean, that, the colleague of mine, his name is Jeffrey Brown uh, at the University of Georgia, and that his, is his approach. Now, I mean, it does get complicated because he's talking about a lot of, he's, he's recruiting both non-residential dads and residential dads. And so, you know, he has to deal with the gatekeeper issue, and so he does, you know, have to go through mom in some cases. But the, the recruitment is, is going to be focused on, on the dads how often we had to make a second visit to get the dads. We couldn't oh, yes. do it through the ways that we were getting the mothers. Oh, yes. We had to find the, the special time. Carmen, there. Carmen, you want to wave? Carmen is responsible for getting the vast majority of our father interaction data with our Latino dads, right? And you had to go, like, any time they'd be there, you go. Yes, especially if, uh, because uh, most of the parents is for low-income families, so they had to work too much, and they come too tired and... I mean, it's part of the Hispanic community, uh, and I especially and, and encourage them be part of the study. And the mothers helping me a lot to to motivate to them to be part of the study. But uh, that was uh, the hard time by the time. But uh, when they see the importance to be part of this study, uh, they feel more confident because I said this study is the first time and we studied the fathers and I mean I try to sell in the most I can to them most of the time. Yeah, we're very grateful for that too, for persistence. Yes. Good morning. I just wanted to thank you for this. I'm, I'm actually a new father myself. Uh, my daughter's only about eight days old. Oh, congratulations! Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, <laughs> right. You know, they they always say uh, kids don't come with instruction manuals, no, but they uh, don't. 
you can be proactive. I just wanted to ask you about one of the PowerPoint slides that said reflect on your role as a father. Yes. I'll and I think you were talking about maybe I'm thinking about their own yeah. uh, relationship with their father and and I just wanted to know if that if that's what you're getting at. Think about the past, the relationship that they had on their fa with their father or how they were up raised is is that where we're going in that direction i believe so i think it was is it this one? yes yes the last yeah bullet. now this is so this is from lee's work and i believe that this particular um, paper is going to be on the website <clears throat> as a resource if you want to read more about in depth on the study but yes it, you know talking about their own relationship i mean and, and and honestly i don't i don't see that as being restricted to dads I think the way that all of us parent, both men and women, is it's driven a lot by how we were parented. And so we, we tend to perpetuate sometimes the worst things about our, our, our parent relationship. So I don't, I don't restrict that to dads. OK. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? So Margaret, I found your relationship between um, Father's sensitive parenting in mathematics mm -hmm. very interesting. So that was in kindergarten. Yes, the math relationship. And have you do you have you don't have data for older the children when they're older? Well, we have them at first grade. And okay. I can't remember if I did okay. that. And then because the fifth the fourth grade data aren't available yet. Okay, so. and you you do the measures you have. You're not sure what's related there. What's right? I mean, it's the Woodcock Johnson was the yeah. so applied problems on the okay. Woodcock Johnson. I just find that really interesting because I wonder. So rough and tumble play was not related. Well, we or don't, don't have, have a measure that. of rubber. We don't have, have a measure of rubber. Yeah, like I said, it makes us wonder if there's something that we missed right. in terms of what we measured. So, yeah, because it makes me wonder, do fathers talk about spatial terms more? You know, mm -hmm. maybe there's motor, spatial play, yeah. those so kinds of I'm things. I'm pointing to my colleague, Raul, who's sitting right in front of you, who's, gonna, who's helping us to at least start transcribing oh. some of the father videos. Oh, I, I don't know anything yet. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, something in like a year, yeah. We're starting to transcribe some of those videos. We've transcribed like, right. like 20 and we have And we have a grant proposal that was just yeah. submitted that would allow us to go back and transcribe so. all the dad videos. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so A lot of transcription. So. Um, I was thinking the same thing about how the, how the parents are interacting differently with the children. And, and it could be the language that they're using when they're rough and tumble, or it could be the type of activities that they're doing that there is more physical or mental manipulation of things when they are activating the motor aspect more. Mm -hmm. And you had shown some slides in the early part of, the, of your um, presentation when you showed that, I don't know if it was always by mom report, but that the amount of time that father spent reading mm -hmm. was lower. And so it made me think if, if they're not spending as much time reading. What then, else are they doing? Well, but also maybe they're not working on the language and there was also something about their language development that they're not always as in tune as maybe the moms are. And so if that would, for me, would make me think, well, maybe they're not focusing on language as much and reading as much. So that might be why you're not seeing that father sensitivity going with reading and the motor skills maybe more going with the math aspect. It, 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 I don't. I don't know, Possibly. but yeah. I could yeah. be making it up. I don't know. Well, we can keep visiting um, at the end, but we're at, we're at the end of our hour. So thank you for wonderful questions, and there's so many more things to explore. And let's give. Or thank you. Thank you.